All right, so I'm sitting here with Arlene La Liberté. Well, not sitting, but zooming here with Arlene, a psychologist and consultant in community well-being at La Louvre Consulting and at the Center for Research and Intervention on Suicide, Ethical Issues, and End of Life Practices. Arlene has a PhD in community psychology from UCAM and was a professor at Université du Québec, Abitibi-Témiscamingue, and Université du Québec, Outaouais. As a postdoc researcher at Queensland University, she participated in a research and action project on the early prevention of suicide risk factors in Indigenous communities. Uh, we asked to speak with her about her experience with Indigenous communities here in Quebec, more specifically her retrospective study of completed suicides. Um, with capacity building and empowerment informing much of her work, we wanted to hear her perspectives on how to address the mental health of Indigenous youth in Quebec. Uh, Arlene, thank you for taking the time to speak with me here today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. So I was hoping you could start out by just telling us a little bit more about your work. About my work? Which part exactly? I guess specifically the work with Indigenous communities here in Quebec. Okay, um, so as you mentioned, I did my doctorate at Cris, UCAM. Um, I studied suicide amongst First Nations communities. So I visited four different uh, First Nations communities in Quebec, and I sat with bereaved people. So people who had lost a loved one by suicide. And I did the life trajectory um, to look at what type of life events, what type of things that happened to these people that brought them to end their life. And what we found, um, there is obviously a lot of problems in communities, but there are also a lot of strengths. And so we looked at the moments when the people reached out for help. We looked also at the moments when there was opportunities for intervention. And it, since it was a participatory research study, the communities were highly involved, um, extremely welcoming, very, very supportive and cooperative. And at the end of the study, I did um, a feedback meetings with them, and they actually took the data and built their suicide response program around the data. And what we saw was really that it was in the weekends, or in the early mornings, you know, late at night, early mornings, where the people would be most distressed. And that's when the services are closed. And these being remote communities, um, a hospital could be maybe three or four hours away. So they really needed to build their response team. And so that changed the way that they intervened. That's actually very interesting. I know that when I traveled up to Nunavik myself, that was one of the main glaring concerns. And I mean, it's not just me who's finding out about that. I think it's pretty well known that I was on my plane ride back. I was I, I ran into someone that I, I had met there and they were taking their daughter three towns away just to go for a, to like a hospital checkup because of some like minor emergency that happened at night. So I know that's a major issue. And, uh, you know, I don't want to you know spend too much time on this because we have all, all kinds of questions, but I find that that's a, a very interesting uh, thing because, and that's why it's important to do this research to find out those kind of little niche areas. Like, for example, you know, the, the times when people are most needed need the services are when the services are closed, and so that's a gap that you know might have otherwise been missed that like clearly needs to needs to be closed. So, yeah. So, full disclosure, I, I googled you and went down a bit of a, a YouTube rabbit hole and found a great uh, video on empowerment and val evaluation. I'm sure you know the one. Um, so, as you know, the topic for our discussion today is building resilient communities. And I wanted to ask you, from a capacity building and or uh, empowerment perspective, what would you say are some key ways for people in general, but specifically Indigenous people, to build their mental health personally and communally? I think, first off, it's important for everyone to recognize that they have strengths. They have qualities. And it seems so almost silly to say that. But at one point in your life, if you've been struggling and if you're in survival mode for such a long time, you can lose sight of your own 
potential of your own inner qualities. And so that is what I bring to my into my work as well. I use a positive psychology approach um, to understand mental illness and well-being. So mental health and well-being that are two different things. And I also look at shining the light on the strengths. And so if a person has been struggling, they're still here. And I think just making that observation, you're still here. What have you been doing that has been working? And sitting and looking at those aspects with them. So it really, it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter if you're suicidal, if you have addiction problems, if you've been to jail, you still have strengths, you still have qualities and It's not only okay, but it's important to recognize those. And so maybe on a more macro approach, deficit focus, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We've been deficit focused and intervening in that way forever. And so I'm working really hard to change the way that we're intervening in mental health and work on the strengths. And even if someone has a chronic Uh, mental illness, for example, schizophrenia or um, borderline personality disorder, they still can achieve well-being within themselves. And so it's really respecting, for me, it's respecting the people that I'm working with. It's respecting their rhythm it's not me coming in and saying oh you have to do this or that it's really look at let's look at what have you been doing so far that has been working that's really interesting and i know that's that's good advice for anyone i mean even just myself hearing it right now it's helping me you know not you know anyway but uh, and not to simplify it but it's it's like just focus on the positive because it can be so easy to kind of lose sight of everything that's working and i, I don't know for myself i i just assume it's a, a perfectionism but no i think that's very very insightful one way or another and it's we have to be careful um i agree focus on the positive but we also have to be careful to acknowledge that there is pain there is suffering there is distress and so it's not trying to minimize the pain or taking away or negating the distress it's taking yes i'm not doing well right now i'm feeling xyz i acknowledge that At the same time, I acknowledge that I've been through this before and I've gotten out of this situation. So what did I do that helped me to get out of that? Mm -hmm. Um, Being able to ask for help as well and help in the right places. Um, That's also, also very important. And I think that as a mental health professional and an Indigenous person, I recognize the strength of land-based healing, of cultural reappropriation, of our own, of gaining strength in our cultural identity as a means of resilience as well. So yeah, sometimes you do need medication. And it doesn't mean that going out on the land, reconnecting with your culture. It's not an either or. And so both can be very uh, supportive. Does that make sense? Oh, no, absolutely. It's great. I was just letting you speak because, again, it's, it's helping me. I know that, you know, something that you said resonated me, <clears throat> resonated with me. <clears throat> it's that when you're going through it, it's hard to remember that you've been through it before. All you can see is that moment and you kind of have blinders on. So, you know, hearing that and knowing that kind of advice is, is definitely helpful to, to make it through some tough situations. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Obviously, currently we are in a uh, pandemic, quarantine, and uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed major problems in the services available to people facing mental health challenges. Um, This is especially true in the North. So I wanted to ask you, what have been or what do you expect to have been the effects on mental health for Indigenous youth in Quebec since the pandemic? Oh my, I wouldn't uh, begin to uh, try and guess 
but um, I'm, I'm going to have to speculate. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the main issues was the fact that school, that schools were out. And I've been hearing different, um, like des cool. I've been hearing from different communities, different teachers, what state will our students be in when they come back to school? Because school, especially in the communities in the form that they are now, when they're culturally safe, when they are a safe space, not only, well, culturally, as well as social and emotional, emotionally safe for the kids, um, they, that can become a, a place for them to get away from chronic stress at home, for example, from overcrowding, from sometimes, um, you know, situations of abuse. And so it, we're taking that away from them. We took that away from them. The structure that it gives, it also helps to maintain balance and mental health and so mental health and well-being. And so we've, that was taken away as well. And so I'm, I would have to speculate that anxiety, that the um, exposure to chronic stress could be heightened in that situation. And it is worrisome. And a lot of communities um, have taken measures to close the community completely and really monitor who's coming in and out, which is reassuring to a lot of, a lot of the parents and a lot of the students. But some communities, um, in, that was not possible. And so I'm going back to school uh, because I also work uh, as a psychologist in one of our schools here in the region. And um, I'm expecting a lot more, a lot more clients, unfortunately, with a lot more issues around anxiety and, and lack of that feeling of safety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And just, you know, speculating myself, I mean, from my my limited personal experiences, like I mentioned, I was up in Nunavik um, in January, made some connections, and I spoke to them during the pandemic, um, some some connections I'd made through the NRBHSS. And they were, that's one thing that, you know, I remember them bringing up was that it's the overcrowding in houses, especially during the winter time. Like, I, you know, I I know they're a little bit more used to it, but still the, the harsh cold climate is not really conducive to, you know, going out and about. And so you have these big families all jammed into these houses for, for months at a time. And it's, it's not their normal routine. So yeah, I can only imagine that that would add to the, the stresses, the stresses involved. So hopefully we, this, this can all end soon and we can kind of get back to things as normal because uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I think the effects might be, might be significant. Um, so the challenges that Indigenous communities face are, are unique in a number of ways, particularly those living in remote communities where resources are scarce and uh, connectivity is a challenge. So what kind of resources, um, for example, actions or support systems are needed to facilitate the changes that youth want to see in building more resilient communities in the North? Um, I think it's... <laughs> The, the answer is in the question. Let's build resilient communities. I, I love my job. I love going to different communities and working with the youth or the families and doing that direct work. But what I prefer to do is actually work with the workers. Build capacity within the community. Um, value the workers. Um, I think it's very, very sad to see, yes, I'm a professional and I do want a fair wage as a professional, but someone who is a social and emotional well-being support person in the community that doesn't necessarily have a formal educate, uh, like formal schooling, but that have the know-how, that have the wisdom, that have the experience, why would we not treat them and value them like a professional that we brought in from outside of the community. So I think there's, and I'm speaking for my, for myself and like gaining from looking back at my own journey, decolonizing our own mind. Because unfortunately with colonization brought internalized racism, it also brought lateral violence. 
And these are the effects of, of colonization that we are also fighting today amongst ourselves. But recognizing our own strengths as individuals, but also the strengths in our communities. Because there are and there have been those pillars in the community. Let's work with them and build their capacity and support their, their confidence and support their ideas and the work that they're doing. In, as, instead of, as well as relying on outside, outside resources. So kind of let's put our money where our mouth is and build, build, our, build our strengths within our communities. Absolutely. I think that's uh, very astute. I mean, that's why we're doing this because, and again, from my own personal experience, experience going up there and meeting many Indigenous people, you see the, the potential there. The, these people are very capable of doing it. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm new to this and I'm learning, but, and, and I know that the, the decolonization of your mind is a very complex thing, but I know that if we could tap into the resources, the resource that is the people and have them believe that they are capable of doing that, I know that would be, that would take it leaps and bounds in as far as uh you know kind of having a, a more resilient community up north for sure absolutely and uh, i experienced it in australia and i worked with um an aboriginal built aboriginally aboriginal created empowerment program and so the this was an organic process that brought people together to reflect on their own life, their own histories. And they were in leadership positions in their communities. And so they took all these insights and built it into a program that they're offering. And now that it's, it's quite um, répandu, it's quite spread in a lot of communities. And there was one community in particular that I had the privilege to work with. They actually built their own health center. Hmm. Wow health and wellness center from, they came from a very acute suicide crisis in the 80s. They found this program, they found other Aboriginal leaders, they got trained up and the training is really time to recognize your own strengths. Mm -hmm. And it's gaining understanding, moving away from blame and gaining understanding, taking responsibility for your actions, and giving back to the community. Um, I'm, I'm a trained psychologist, so of course I'm not going to say, ooh, individual therapy doesn't work. However, the lack in individual therapy is it's individual. Whereas this program brought you to want to share your knowledge, your strengths, and your positive experiences with others. And the goal was not only your own healing, but it was the healing of your family and of your community. And so it's just, I think, looking at things in a different way, recognizing that as Aboriginal people, we have a tremendously rich history. And I will never apologize for not speaking my language. That, that my language was taken away from me. It's not something that I, I failed to do. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at and trying to um, faire la part des choses, um, what belongs to me and what doesn't belong to me. So it's really working on figuring that out as well. And what does belong to me and what is within my power, I can act on that. Mm -hmm. And I can do good around me. Mm -hmm with help, with training, with, with support. Mm -hmm. But as a support person, for example, going into another community, my goal is to work myself out of a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. I was just, yeah, I was just taking that all in. I think, um, you know, it is about changing the narrative for people and the example that you, you made in the beginning of, of the, the community building their own health center is just such an example of what, we, what we've been talking about, the, the potential um, to do great things there. And I, I think that that, that 
you know, example brought to other communities shown to show like what can be done could be great in, in, in doing just that changing the narrative. So, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, hopefully we can, you know, shed light on this and get more people to understand, you know, these kind of things are possible for sure. And I think creating opportunities for communities to share with one another, um, that could be, you know, like a, a way forward as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, again, that's what we, we hope to do with, with things like this, to have many different eyes from different communities on, on these kind of ideas and, and things like that. So um, what Indigenous mental health and support services currently exist and what improvements do you think need to be made? That seems like a very big question. What Indigenous support systems exist? Mental health and social support systems currently exist. Um, well, in our communities in the South, like First Nations communities, we have first line services, uh, which is to help families um, basically it's to bring down the numbers, or I don't want to frame it in a negative. It's to support families to be healthier and keep the children in the community. So it's another way of healing, healing as families and helping parents to better support their children. Um, because we know with residential school, the, the huge impact that that had on breaking families and you never learned how to be a parent because you never are you, you know, seldomly lived in a family setting. And so I think it's gaining that understanding of everything that was taken like everything that was taken away from Indigenous people and and helping us to regain it. So first line services, there are different um, brighter futures, for example, that help with um, the children, their developmental stages, stimulation early on. Um, there has, well, I think I have to say the NIHB, non-insured health benefits program that provides mental mental health support um, to First Nations, well, to status Indians. Um, that's a whole other can of worms, but I'm basically paid through that program for the work that I do in the communities um, around here. So there are, there's NADAP, the National Native Alcohol and Drug Addictions Program that that helps support as well. So there are programs and there is a lot of good work being done in communities. What I would like to see is more promotion, mental health promotion. Mm -hmm. Like for example, the Brighter Futures, that falls into promotion. You know, you might be thinking, ooh, well, what does baby massage have to do with mental health? Well, mm -hmm. it has everything to do with mental health because we're stimulating, we're stimulating babies, we're supporting that link that attachment, that healthy attachment between the baby and the primary caregiver. And so I think looking at mental health in terms of mental wellness as a whole could be um, very helpful as well for mm -hmm. moving forward in the future. For sure. Um, if, if what I understand is correct, it, it sounds like there are a lot of services that are out there. It's just a matter of getting them to the people and getting people in the right mindset to be comfortable using them. I'm sure there's some barriers around that too. And it, just as you were mentioning it, yes, there are a lot of services, but they have to be culturally safe. Mm -hmm. And the people have to feel that this corresponds to what they need and how they want to be helped. So if I have someone in my office and have them talk about their problems, they'll be there forever. But if I have someone in my office who's going through a very, very difficult time and I ask them, for example, wow, you went through all of this and you're still here. Could you tell me how, how you did that? And of course, the first response is, you know, they kind of laugh and I don't know. But we can, we can dig a little bit and find those strengths. And the way of being, I think it's, it's important to respect 
not I think, it is important to respect Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. And we don't fit in a box. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, I think, as a, as a service provider, to be humble, to have enough humility to recognize that I'm not the one changing you. You are the one changing you. Mm-hmm. I'm there to help you. So I think leaving our island of expert and moving closer to the person and walking with them as opposed to telling them what to do can be very helpful. For sure. And I know the the intervention of a professional like yourself is so, so powerful because like we were saying, left to our own devices, we can kind of just fall into the, the bad thinking patterns that I think all of us have. And especially when you're talking about, and I won't speak out of turn, but especially when you're talking about traditions that have kind of been cut off and, and, and they haven't, you know, they don't understand how to deal with those things from generations and passed on. They're kind of, you know, again, left to their own devices to figure it, figure that out. Having someone come in and just kind of remind them of things things like that, like, look how well you are doing, you're still here, and, and you're doing so well. I just know that that's such a powerful thing for, for a lot of people, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving on, there, there are some clear uh, differences in how mental health affects genders. For example, when in Nunavik this past January, I was told by numerous people that uh, it's the, the men, it's the Inuit men who tend to, to suffer the most. Um, you know, and there were some reasons beyond that, but I, you know, I can you know, let you discuss that. So, so everyone needs uh, access to better health services, but, but are there differences in what services uh, men versus women versus two spirit people need, for example, and uh, how can these challenges be addressed? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, studies show not only in First Nations or Indigenous communities, but in communities mainstream at large, that distress, that men do not express their distress the same way as women. So a man's distress could not be, could go unrecognized. Mm -hmm. And so looking at other ways of expressing distress, and unfortunately, what like with the Inuit um, First Nations people is are experiencing similar similar issues, mainly because the role of the man was taken away, mm. and so responding with anger because you can't provide for your family. I think that's completely normal. Mm-hmm. Feeling distressed because you can't provide for your family is absolutely normal. So I think it's being able to recognize that anger is not a bad thing. Anger is an emotion like joy or happiness or worry or sadness. It's an emotion. It's really how do we express it and where are the challenge, the channels to be able to express that, that very, intense and displeasing emotion so i think it's the way to intervene um men's groups for example have been proven well have been i guess there's empiric empirical evidence that support implementation of men's groups so men helping men um And it's not, again, trying to fit them in a box of, okay, well, come and sit and tell me about your, about your problems. A lot of men are comfortable expressing themselves, expressing their feelings, but a lot of men aren't. And a lot of these men will, they're more in action. So, a lot of times, oh, let's go for a walk or let's go for a drive. And in doing, whoops, all of a sudden there's a little bit of sharing, a little more sharing. And so I think it's creating environments that are safe for men. And with social socialization being the way it is, boys don't cry. Um, men are tough. Men, let's break down those barriers. Men do cry. Men do have emotions men do get sad and that's okay but at the same time 
creating safe spaces within the community until this whole social, because, you know, changing society, it, it takes a long time. But if we can reach out to men in a way that they recognize as non-threatening and as helpful, what if they're not talking about their problem? They're there, they're gaining pride, they're gaining well-being, they're sharing, they're creating relationships. Isn't that the goal? Mm -hmm. Oh, but he didn't say about end. So it's really recognizing that different ways of helping, even if they don't look like therapy or that it's still very helpful and supportive. And if that man comes in a crisis, you know, chances are he'll turn to the other men of the men's group or they will notice and they will reach out to him. For sure. And I imagine that would cause kind of a chain, chain reaction. You know, like, like you said, I'm sure there's so many different effective ways to, to do this and, and to heal people. And, and like you mentioned, there's so many cultural uh, and historical barriers that people don't understand. And again, it's back to the importance of, of, of hearing people like you, psychologists who understand to kind of, you know, in, inform people about this because just again left to their own device people who don't know they don't understand that you know it's okay for men to cry they, they it's normal for them to doing that to be doing that and uh and and then also i think i'm sure there's a cultural element of of not being comfortable with seeking out help as well mm -hmm. so kind of just changing the paradigm around all that stuff and it goes back to what you were saying before about uh promotion you know it, that can be done through the promotion of the of these services to a number of people and also just the way that it's promoted too so you know i just i think that there's just so much room for for, for growth i think that's the good news you know there's a lot that can be done and hopefully you know with people like you it, it can be done um, so I have two ways I, I want to go with it right now, but you mentioned something about change is slow. So, so yeah, change is slow. We know that, especially when it comes to government and uh, policy, how can youth, uh, keep motivated as they wait for adequate and appropriate services to, uh, be presented? I want to say, don't wait, mm. advocate. Mm. I want to say, go to school. Mm. Yes. We, we can view um, university, for example, as a, like, I don't know, a colonial sausage machine. You know, everybody comes in different. Everybody comes out the same. Um, there are exceptions. Mm. <laughs> but, I mean, an education opens doors. And I've considered myself as a translator for many, many years in the sense where I was working with communities and we'd, um, we'd, we'd identify an issue with the community and they wanted to, you know, oh, let's build a program or let's try and get funding to address these issues. And so I would sit with them and I'd write up a grant. So basically speaking government language. And that's what I'm saying, translation, where how can we address this issue and get the funders to understand what we're doing. And unfortunately, yes, you know, uh, Aboriginal Indigenous people are oppressed. There is ongoing colonization, but it is also up to us to educate ourselves, to decolonize ourselves, and to find resources to continue to, to fight the system, to change the system. Um, it's not easy. We need allies, but I would say, don't wait, advocate, make the best choices that you possibly can for yourself, for your own life. And if you want to change the situation, change yourself. Mm. I have to say, I really like that answer. 
um, for people, youth especially, to take action. You know, it's so important to take an active role rather than a passive role. I think it's as simple as if, and, and everyone should do that. It's it's amazing how, you know, for, for whatever reason, pe- people don't and they feel powerless. But really, we have so much power and agency. And if everyone did their little part, all these problems would probably be, well, that's, you know, a bit idealistic. But I imagine, I, I think, I have a hunch that all these problems would be fixed, you know, a lot a lot sooner for sure mm-hmm. yeah. and um, of course we can't we we have to be careful like, and i'm saying this and i'm reminding myself like we can't blame the victim you know if you're if you get hit by a car and you're laying there bleeding well you're going to need an ambulance to come and help you and doctors to patch you up and and send you on your way and that's when that help is needed and those allies are needed. So it's not, oh, no matter what condition you are, we'll pull yourself up from your bootstraps. No, it's really, no matter what condition you are, please recognize that you do have strengths, that you do have qualities. And even if you are being, and it doesn't matter what field, you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse or someone in a mental health profession, be the best you that you can be. And that in itself is an important um, is an important change because I'm looking, well, two of my uncles died of alcoholism. And of course, that makes me sad. That makes me um, angry. But I'm not angry at them. I know that because of their consequences and their circumstances, they did the best that they could do with what they had. And so for me, recognizing that and not falling in blaming our anger is another way of continuing on this fight so that no one, no other uncles die from alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Of course. I I have to say, I'm so sorry to hear, hear about your uncle's um, if anything, you know, for, for them and, and for all of us, I hope that people can learn from from your response and, and what, you know, the way that you're handling it to kind of make something positive out of it to, to do that, make something positive for themselves and, and for all of us. I think that's, uh, that's pretty important. Um, so Arlene, once again, I th- thank you for taking the time to speak with, with me today. Um, we really appreciate all the work uh, that you do for Indigenous communities and uh, hopefully we can uh, have a chance to to meet and talk again soon. I would really enjoy that. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope it helps. Oh, it definitely will help. (laughs) Some very good answers. Thank you. Thank you.